Hi, I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit. Every episode, we explore death, dying, and grief through stories by authors familiar with the topic. Writers are our translators. They take what is inexpressible, impossible to explain, and they translate it into words on a page. My guest today is Irini Carson. Her first book, The Dead Are Gods, is all about the unexpected death of her best friend who privately struggled with addiction. If you've ever felt like you needed permission to grieve or your grief just wasn't understood by others, this book and this episode is for you. Irini and I get into grief and the particular sting of losing someone young. She has so much compassion and insight into addiction and grief and memory. And she gives us a blueprint for how to remember our loved ones as whole, flawed, messy, wonderful people. I'm not the only one who enjoyed her book. In 2023, The Dead Are Gods was on Oprah's spring reading list. I hope you enjoy our conversation and her book. Hi, Irini. It's nice to meet you. Hello. Well, I will say I absolutely loved your book. Thank you. And I love the picture of you and Larissa on the cover. We were in somewhere in West London in some fancy bougie bar. She was wearing this Roberto Cavalli dress. But I still, I don't know where it came from or how she afforded it because we weren't making Roberto Cavalli money. And (laughs) the person taking the photo was some dude who was just buying us drinks and we made him him take (laughs) our photo. I remember my hair was really greasy that day. I didn't want to wash it. So (laughs) I didn't. And yeah, that's that photo. I have it on my phone and it's really funny to look at it now. Like, I'm, you know, the cover of the book is is very much at the forefront of my mind. But when I look at that photo and see the detail and and the Mm close-upness, that just feels kind of unifying. Yeah, it's really, really beautiful. Oh, thank you. So one of the things I say in Peaceful Exit is writers are our translators. And for me, your book is like the perfect example of that. Um, Someone who is walking us through that grief process, that grief experience. It's so beautifully written. Thank you. I wonder if I could read a little passage. Yeah, absolutely. It is ironic that my first book, My Most Precious Body of Work, came out of your death. You, my most fervent champion of my writing, something like poppies growing on graves, something like a diamond being made out of ashes. A steady stream has poured out onto the page. I often wonder, in my deep grieving madness, if it isn't your hands at the keyboard, steady and certain, editing my words into something cohesive, something beautiful and something true. I don't know, it's a really funny thing now, because when I wrote that, I guess I knew I had a book, but it was different than than how it is now where the book is done and it's in the world. And there is this certain amount of sharing and vulnerability in publishing it. And so I do feel like Larissa was very much with me while I was writing and less so now. Like, not that she's not with me, but with the book, I feel like the book is kind of this separate thing Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever read Harry Potter with your kids but um kind of like a horcrux or something you know like something lives in it but it is separate to the person it came from yes yeah and there is a kind of a curious thing that happened when I published the book in that my grief was like this little package now like this physical book that you have on your desk right now that I'm looking at that was my grief and I had to kind of dig my way back to a personal relationship with it because for a long time it was this thing like are we going to get a publisher are we Mm. have we hit the word count have we um what will the cover look like what does your author photo look you know it just kind of became this this separate entity and so to come back to my grief now and to Larissa seems crucial and I don't know if I've done it yet I'm working on it Mm. (laughs) Do you feel like it becomes sort of rote because you're talking to a lot of people about the book as a separate entity that it pulls you away from the grief? Yeah, a little bit. The thing that has like kind of anchored me 
are the book readings I've done because those feel almost like a like a grief group mm-hmm. <laughs> because people end up sharing like people want to talk about these things as you know yes and in the rooms that I've read in it's felt permissible to do so so in that respect it kind of pulled me back in into my grief those moments there is like there's definitely a rightness to it though you know the way I answer the questions or all the types of questions that I'm asked yeah yeah, no pressure. Same sorts of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, losing someone so young is a very unique experience. Yeah. It's heartbreaking, layered on with her addiction that you weren't aware of. And there's so many nuances to that. I don't know of any other books out there, that There's no, or at least not enough out there, that really honor young friendships and honor that grief and shock that you experienced? I definitely was searching for something when she died and couldn't find it, which is sort of where this book came from, the need, as many things do. Yeah, (laughs) write the book that you want to read. Right, exactly. I'm just really frightened of forgetting the thought, (laughs) which again is why the book is here. Yeah. I'm scared of forgetting, so it's important to me to document. Well, let's talk about forgetting and memory. How does that work in this, in this area of grief? You talk about it a little bit in the book, whether remembering is actually an accurate portrayal of what actually happened. And Well, <laughs> when someone is a formative friend, like Larissa was for me, and so much of my life experience was filtered through her eyes, her hands, like all, all of it. She held it all for me. And so her dying made me realize that now it's just me, which seems like an obvious, an obvious remark, but like it was, it felt like a heavy weight that I would have to carry these memories and thoughts and these important things because they were so important. These things that aren't even in the book, these like life changing moments that she gave me the, uh, the comfort in her presence the way her hand felt in mine, these things Mm. needed to be remembered. I did not want them forgotten because I felt like if I forgot then that I would forget her and I would just, you know, people die in time, passage of time. And, and you, you feel like, Oh, maybe I think we were good friends. Like that's how I think it was in my head, but it's been so long. I can't really remember. And I wanted it cemented. No, we were best friends. We were sisters. And I loved her. And she loved me. And you have to know that. (laughs) I have to tell you. Were people dismissive of your friendship or your grief? No, I think I did that to myself. Hmm. Even at her funeral, her mum was sobbing. And I felt I couldn't do that also like it just felt like I was it was kind of imposter syndrome in your in my grief which is so ridiculous I think we're taught that the family that you marry the family that you birth that is the thing those are the things that you can mourn and friendship is like yeah sure she died but she was a friend it just seems so flippant and nothing It took me a little while to sit with it and realize that my grief was as grand and huge uh, as if my husband had died or something. You know, it felt it felt the breathness was no different just because we weren't really sisters or married or lovers or, you know. And you portray it beautifully because as a reader, I'm absolutely there with you that your grief is real. And Mm. are there any little things that bring her memory? forward maybe something that you and Larissa did together yeah very much so I mean music um it was just a big part of the scene that we found ourselves on there were uh, members of bands in our friendship group and so that just like inherently brings music in so I have playlists galore on my phone uh when she died and we were going to her funeral I made all her friends and our friends give me songs that reminded them of her. Mm-hmm. And like the playlist is very jarring because it goes from like Elliot Smith to Little Kim 
And, like, <laughs> and then there's some Brian Jonestown massacre and then there's Mob Deep. And it's like, just like, there's just very eclectic. And now my husband knows those playlists well. So when I put that on, I'm thinking about her and everyone, or well, he treads a little lighter. Yeah. So I understand you have two little girls. Yeah. Do you talk to them about Larissa or do you talk to them about death and dying at all? I do. I talk about Larissa a lot. She is the background on my phone. And so often I'll be checking my phone and she's right there and I'll, you know, like, flashcards would be like who is this who is it and they'll say auntie larissa and i think some days i'm sad that she's dead and i'm crying and i try to explain to them like i'm sad today for this reason just so you know (laughs) it's so so important to share that with your kids that it's okay to be sad what about you with your children were you candid my mother died about 21 years ago And uh, I was pregnant with our third child and went into labor as we were spreading her ashes on Mother's Day. Oh, wow. Um, It was one of those I had to set aside my grief to to take care of a newborn. And so I think while my kids experienced that with me, you know, they felt what was going on and but they had a new Mm. sibling and, you know, there was so much going on at that time that I don't remember actually what I shared with them at the time. Um, Mm -hmm. And as they grew, I mean, part of the reason I'm doing this work now, you know, 21 years later, is that seed was planted that I didn't feel at the time I had the freedom to share that with my kids. And I didn't have the freedom to to express my grief. Mm -hmm. I think about the Victorian tradition of, when you were grieving someone, you'd have a black band on your arm so that everyone knew that that lasted one year. And when that year was done, you took it off and you moved the fuck on because <laughs> that your time was up, you know? And I just, I mean, at least that there is something beautiful in that, in that this person has a black band on. Mm-hmm. It's a visible signifier of grief and loss and an explanation maybe as to why they're talking to themselves in the market or whatever, you know. Are bursting into tears of the market. Yeah. Yeah. So you go kind of in and out of writing directly to Larissa, then speaking to the reader about her, and you have emails at the end of each chapter. How did you decide on a structure for your book? Well, once I realized I had a book, because it took me a while to figure that out, uh, Larissa and I would communicate a lot via WhatsApp, and so we would leave each other voice notes there are so many just like wonderful voice notes I listen to still. And I wanted a little personhood in the book. I didn't want it to feel like a eulogy. I wanted it to feel like a full person. Like you were meeting Larissa, but the fullness of her was in this book. And I wanted the voice notes in there, but it's audio. And so that doesn't work. So I looked through our emails and I just... We have so many. The What's in the book is not even the scratching the surface. There's so much. And I picked the most appropriate ones. (laughs) And um, I felt like it was a a natural break in my pain and my grief that is visceral in the book. And the reader needs and deserves a reprieve. And you should know that Larissa wasn't all sadness and grief. She was also a lover of really silly nicknames for her friends, you know? Um, So that felt important to me. I love that sort of wide range. You know, you represent grief as many, many emotions, not just sadness. Thank you. And she does feel like a whole real person. I love that you titled one of the chapters, I Don't Like You. (laughs) (laughs) That's my favorite one to read at readings. It was an enjoyable process to write that one, which seems a little... I don't know, sacrilegious or something. I remember uh, my mother's memorial. She was almost deified. You know, people would come up to me and say things about her. And I ended up feeling like, well, she was a regular human, you know. Yeah. Uh, The notion of not speaking in of the dead is like something we carry along. Mm -hmm. And so it seems dangerous or disrespectful to mention anything other than 
he was a wonderful husband and neighbor or something, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It just, but that just seems, it's so flattening. It's such a smushing action to do that. You really lose all of the complexities of a person. And mm-hmm. I think with this book, I really, I had a hard time. The first time I, my first draft, I did not talk about the way in which Larissa died at all. It felt wrong and I couldn't advance further in my writing and so I was just kind of stuck I was like well I'm not going to write about this thing but I'm going to write around it so I'm just going to keep going and finish this book and I couldn't and one of my friends said what if you just wrote about how she died just as to see how it goes and it just poured out of me in this way that made me understand that I couldn't tell the story of Larissa without including that because that is a part of her life It, it is it's how it ended. And so I have to hold that, even though it's not my favorite thing to hold. Right. The, the including of heroin happens late in the book for that reason, because I don't want you to come with preconceived notions of what it means to use heroin. I want you to know her first so that you can know that she was full. Because we also flatten people who use drugs into this 2D thing. Two-dimensional stereotype. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my authors for this podcast, actually, W.J.T. Mitchell, wrote a book about losing his son to schizophrenia and Mm -hmm. the stigma around schizophrenia and how his son brilliantly during his lifetime really claimed it and wanted to shift that stigma around mental illness. And I feel like you're doing that a little bit with this book around addiction. I I really hope so. It's It was a hard one because it was such a, I was reluctant to include it and then understood why it was essential if I was going to tell this story. But also I have been reluctant to use it as a selling point of the book. I don't really talk about it frequently. Mm -hmm. I don't really talk about it at readings. I don't want it to seem like I am taking this thing that happened and making it this book's also about addiction. <laughs> Grab yeah, it yeah. now. Let's see what happens. But I now that now that the book is out and it kind of has its own life happening, I feel more comfortable in talking about those things. I do think there are stigmas and um prejudices that I hold in myself, despite having a friend who died of substance use. I too find it jarring. I saw someone shooting up in San Francisco in broad daylight uh, a few weeks ago. And I remember being like, Jesus Christ, are you joking? Like, I've got my kids in the car. Yuck. And then I thought to myself, like, this person does not want to be here doing this. This was not in their vision board for their life. Like, this is not, this is a necessity that I'm watching being performed. You know, this is how they keep living is they do this thing today here in the street. And I feel a lot more compassion um, after Larissa's death than I did before. I think I talk about it in the book. My father also used heroin. And I think for that reason, and because he was absent, I just thought, I decided that that was the mark of a bad person. Because what kind of person would choose that over their children? And now I understand a little more about it. And through that, it grew compassion, like moss, you know, it's everywhere now. And I make an effort to try and understand. No, I think it's really important that we talk about it. Yeah. And you wrote about it so graciously. And and you, you give us a really sweet glimpse into your friendship. I'm sure it's curated and un, and censored a little bit, but it felt uncensored in the way that you write. And I just love the story about how you two were always making a baked potato and leaving it in the microwave, (laughs) making sure the other had something to eat. The small, sweet gestures and a friendship that um, it says so much about you and Larissa. Oh, thank you. I still love a potato from time to time. A baked (laughs) potato? Yeah, a baked potato if I have the patience. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, any other way, when I wrote that, I, tru- I truly made potatoes when I wrote that chapter because I was like thinking about it, about what a boring, <laughs> cheap, uninspired meal that was. But it made me, I was hungry for it. 
but they're delicious. Stand by it. They are. They are delicious. <laughs> so let's talk about survivor's guilt. It seems very present in the book. Yeah, it's present here now. <laughs> yeah. I try not to compare my grief to anyone else's. And in that same breath, I think that there is something particularly painful, a special kind of pain when you lose someone who is young or, uh, you know, a parent losing a child. Like these, it's not happening in the sequence it's supposed to. Um, and it feels jarring. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that as my life continues and I do these fun things, I wonder what she would have been like or what would have happened next you know yeah and that's kind of the cruelty of grief is that robbing of possibilities how has the, this loss impacted how you view death or grief or how, how has it changed for you um well, was a lot more present <laughs> than it was you know I mean when Larissa died I was just stepped a toe into my 30s like I still considered myself a mortal and so I think now I know that that's not the case and I talk about this in the book too of um, this kind of obsession with imagining all of the ways I could die Mm -hmm. which sounds so dark but actually I feel like it keeps me in the moment you know yeah I think mortality is prevalent for everyone the idea of mortality a post-covid for sure I think I think we've done a really shit job of grieving COVID and like processing what that meant. I completely agree. And I have a kid who was high school class of 2020. We were just, my husband and I were just talking about how robbed those kids were. Suddenly it's over and you're in college. Like what? You didn't even get to do the cool stuff. I did when I left high school. You just missed, you missed so much. Well, it's a, it's a really important ceremony, that ritual of passing that time and all of those years in the early years being in school. And um, what can we do about all of this grief? It's like pervasive grief after COVID. It is pervasive and it feels um, insurmountable. You know, it's just like there's so much. Where do you begin? I don't know, because I think we'd have to acknowledge quite a lot. Mm. about what happened and how we behaved and the the people we left behind. And I don't know if we'll be able to do that fully. In the kind of broader sense of grief, something that I do that I consider like my step one is when someone tells me they lost someone, I ask the name of the person. That feels like the the very least we can Mm -hmm. do when we hear that. I actually haven't asked you the name of your mum. Jane. Jane. Yeah. Because that's a connection now. Now I know her name was Jane and she lives in my head now a little bit, a tiny bit, because I don't know her, but I know her name. It's a way of continuing. Yeah, she died at 67, which feels very young to me. Too young. Too young. And died of cancer. I'm so yeah. sorry. Yeah, no worries. No, Sarah, not no worries. <laughs> See, you did it too. I did it too. You brushed over this this thing because you wanted me to feel okay. But it's okay. It's true. No, we're we're working through it. We're working through it. I know. It's interesting because lately I've missed her a lot more. I think maybe that's because recently became empty nesters where everyone has moved out, you know, and it's the new phase of, of life. Do you think that now you have space for your grief in a way that you didn't before? Yeah, and I've been and I've been writing about her a lot more too. You know, the book I'm writing is the story of, you know, when she died and why I'm doing this work too. So, of course, she's more present. I'd love to know like a little fact about Jane so I can file it with her name. Um, so I took a photograph of her after her diagnosis and she still had her hair. She had long hair, but she would wrap it on the back of her head. She had on a sweatshirt that I'd given her. It was green. And I was following her on a single track trail through the rainforest here. And at one point she just turns around and I snapped a photo of her. She loved that trail. It was one of the last longer conversations that we had, just the two of us, Mm -hmm. until she got caught up in all the medical establishment. And yeah, she she loved to be out in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. That's where she found her peace. That's really lovely. 
Do you feel closest to her when you're there? We sp- we spread the ashes along the trail that I took this picture on. So it it will always I will always feel close to her on that trail. That's really lovely. Yeah. So I'd love to know, especially after kind of tr- translating what was a very intense grief experience and still is for you into this beautiful book. What would a peaceful exit mean to you? I think surrounded with people who know you, really, really know you and love you anyway. (laughs) (laughs) And just all agreeing that it's time. (laughs) That seems peaceful. I love these stories of people deciding, people living with terminal illness who decide that they're ready to die and and being in places where they get to make that choice. I love the like confronting of it. I love the idea that death is a door and we could walk through it. That's quite nice. Well, thank you for this. Yeah, you're so welcome. And thank you for this conversation. And I just really, really appreciate your time because that's the greatest gift is your time. So thank you. Oh man, thank you, Sarah. What a treat. Thank you for listening to Peaceful Exit. You can learn more about this podcast and my online course at my website, peacefulexit.net. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know. You can rate and review this show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. This episode was produced by Large Media. You can find them at larjmedia.com. Special thanks to Ricardo Russell for the original music throughout this podcast. More of his music can be found on Bandcamp. As always, thanks for listening. I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit.